Thank you, music team. Thank you. That was very, very good today. Good stuff. Open your Bibles today, if you brought them, to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. If you didn't bring a Bible, there's a bunch there on the rack in front of you. It's on page 311 today. Uh, it's also in the Version Bible app on your phone. Tap on more at the bottom, tap on events, and you'll find all the scripture there for you, all the notes there for you, as well as some, I think today there's some bonus content in there for you. Uh, you can check that out in the Version Bible app. 2 Kings chapter 5 on page 311 there. You know, some of you heard my story um, some years ago when I was deciding where to go to college. I had my plan of where I wanted to go. My target, the thing that I was aiming for, I knew God had called me to preach uh, uh, a long time ago, and I knew that's what God wanted me to do. But something that I had, a desire within my heart, was to play basketball. And I wanted to play basketball, and I knew God wanted me to preach, and so my thought process was, okay, if God wants me to do that, well, then I will pick a college to go to that has that kind of education but will still let me do what I want to do. And so I was looking around at schools of where to go, and, and in the, that process, I knew the college God wanted me to go to. But the school God wanted me to go to had disbanded their basketball program a year or two before. And I said, well, that is not where I am going to go. And I found another school that had a college of theology, and so I was going to go to that school get that education, and they had a basketball team. So that's what I was going to do. That's where I was going to aim. That's the target I was going to shoot for. But in the process of arguing, arguing with God and God uh, bringing up several different issues, and it was actually a year of arguing with God, and I finally relented to what he desired, and as a result... Many, many things have transpired because of that. Not only different people I met, different processes, I met my wife in that course, and we've now been married for over a decade and have four kids, and, uh, and through that whole process as well, it led me down certain jobs to another job to another job that led me to First Baptist Church to Queen, all because of a decision that was made many, many years ago. Because God knew the path that he wanted me to go down. God knew the target he wanted me to aim at, the bullseye I needed to hit. But I wanted to aim at the one I wanted to aim at. I know that's never been the case with you, that God has said, I know you need to do a particular thing. And you say, well, I've got this other thing I want to do. And so you try to justify the thing you want to do and say, well, that will bring God glory in this way. I know that's not you. I mean, that's what I did. I mean, obviously, you, you all are a lot holier than I was at that point. But I tried to justify what I wanted, the target I was shooting for, and God brought me around to his target to aim at. And what we're going to see here in 2 Kings chapter 5 are three different people who were faced with a life situation, a life circumstance, a life circumstance and we're going to see what their lives are aiming at in that process. You see, our lives, whatever our plan is, uh, the systems we have set up in our lives, there are many shifting sands we may experience in that process. And what can we do with the shifting sands of our life system in today's culture? Well, there is an earthquake-proof source of stability we need to be looking at. And that's what we're going to see here. 2 Kings chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 1. It says, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. So we're introduced to this guy named Naaman. He works as a commander in the army of Syria. And in Syria, at this point, is a, an enemy of Israel, a sworn enemy of Israel. Actually, the king of Syria uh, had messed around with the king of Israel. He had been an instigator trying to stir up trouble and trying to uh, initiate a fight at times in the past. 
And we see here a part of his army is this guy named Naaman. He's a great warrior, it says. He's a mighty man of valor. He is a great instrument of warfare. And the king loves him because of all he does for him. And he has done many, many, many things. But we see that all of that great stuff that goes with being Naaman and having his life be as fantastic as he thinks it is, as skilled as he plans to be, he is a leper. He's got that terrible skin disease that has uh, uh, not very good side effects. And that is what he has to deal with every day of his life, even as he goes out and commands the army for the king of Syria. He has to deal with this leprosy day in and day out. Look at verse 2. Now the Syrians, on one of their raids, had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. Now this is interesting. This is where we get to introduce to some different people here. There was a little girl who was captured in the process of the Syrians raiding Israelite cities. They would go in, they would kill a bunch of people, they would take a bunch of stuff, and in this process, they took this little girl. She's probably seven, eight, nine years old. Uh, most likely, in, the, in, in what the Syrians would do in, in, in taking all of the plunder from the city, they probably killed this little girl's parents. And they took her, and now she has been made a slave in the household of Naaman serving his wife uh, from the time that she is of this age until she dies uh, uh, later on, many, many, many years later. This is the only time we meet her, though. Uh, Look at verse 3, this little girl. She says to her mistress, Would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, that's the capital of Israel, he would cure him of his leprosy. Now this is interesting, all right? This girl is a slave in the household of Naaman, knows he's a leper, having served now for a little while. And what she does, would, if only Naaman would go to Samaria where the prophet lives, and when anybody would speak of the prophet in Israel, they weren't just talking about the prophet as the man of God. They were talking about the prophet in terms of God. This is God's man. The prophet is representative of God. And so when the little girl is saying, if only Naaman would go to the prophet, She's saying if only Naaman would seek out God, he could be healed. And so Naaman hears this. And at this point, to put you in Naaman's mindset, I'm sure some of you have been in this mindset if you've ever had a desperate uh, health issue in your life or an issue of someone in your family. You see, when it comes down to Naaman, he has done many, many things. Everything. He's exhausted every opportunity. Every doctor in Syria has been sought out. Every uh, alternative medicine has been pursued. And now this girl in his household says, well, there might be one more opportunity for you. And hope begins to arise in Naaman's heart. Undoubtedly, he's guarding himself a little bit. He doesn't want to get too hopeful that this thing might actually work and might actually heal him. But he's going to take this news to the king. Verse 4. So Naaman went in and told his lord. Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman walks into the king and says, There's this prophet over in Israel, in their capital, Samaria, and if I go over there, maybe he can heal me. And the king says, definitely, let me write you a letter to the king of, of Israel, and you go over there, take this letter, take a bunch of gold and stuff, and, and go and see if this guy can heal you. So the king writes a letter, hands it to Naaman. Naaman packs up a bunch of gold, as you're going to see here in the next verse, or the rest of that verse. It says, so he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold and 10 changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I sent to you Naaman my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And now, so that's what the letter says. I'm sending you Naaman, my servant. And Naaman's name would be known to the king of Israel because he was a great commander. And he says, I am sending him to you for you to heal him. Nothing in the letter says anything about the prophet. Nothing in the letter says anything about the prophet's name, which is Elisha. And so the king opens this letter. And remember the context I told you. The king of Syria was an instigator. The king of Israel's dad, the the king before him who preceded him, had been at war with the king of Syria in, in desperation. 
uh, and had been defeated mightily. And so the king of Syria writes this letter, and the king of Israel opens it, and it says, I'm sending you my greatest commander that you heal him. So he's not reading it in the terms of that you would heal him. He's reading it in the terms that you would heal him with the subtext of if you don't, I'm coming after you. You better heal Naaman. And now the king of Israel reads this letter, and his instinct is, is uh, uh, worry and anxiety and panic. Now this king of Israel, you need to know something a little bit about him. He does not follow God. He has intentionally removed any influence of God from his life. So his first thought isn't, well, then I'm obviously going to send him to Elisha because that is, is where God's power is, is flowing through. I'm not going to send him there. This king has removed all influence of God from his life and from the nation that he possibly could. And so his first response is desperation and panic. Look at what he says, verse 7. The king of Israel read the letter and he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends words to me to cure a man of leprosy? Only consider and see he is seeking a quarrel with me. Now I know in our language that doesn't sound very severe in what he's saying. Oh, he's seeking a quarrel with me. But in the way they said it back in the day, as he's tearing his clothes, which is a sign of grief and sadness and deep emotion, uh, he, he is saying, this guy is seeking war with Israel because he wants me to cure his right-hand man who has leprosy, the incurable disease. Who can do this? Elisha never crosses his mind. God never crosses his mind except in that you know, vain way there. And so because the king has removed God from his life, he finds his emotions in turmoil. He finds his life at this point in time aimless. You see, if you have removed yourself from God's influence, your conclusion jumping leads to desperation and emotional earthquakes. Your emotions will have no solid ground to stand on if you are not standing on God himself. If God is not the calming influence in your life, then you will panic. You will be overwhelmed by the anxiety that comes from the shifting sands of this culture and this life and the circumstances that will inevitably arise, and they will arise within you, just as this king did. You see, he had a problem, and that problem was God was not present with him. God's persistent influence provides spiritual and emotional stability. God's persistent influence provides spiritual and emotional stability. And the key word there is persistent influence. You see, if the only influence of God that you get is either coming to church for an hour or a week or accidentally uh, hitting on the, the Christian channel on TV before you flip over to you hit the recall button because you didn't mean to go there. I mean, who means to go to the Christian channel, right? I mean, nobody means to go to the Christian channel. You want to get back to the regular stuff you're watching or hit Netflix or whatever. You see, when God is not a, a persistent and consistent influence in your life, then there will not be stability. He is the solid ground. Everything else is shifting sand. And if we are not grounded in the, uh, the rock that is Jesus, our foundation stone, then when situations arise, when the winds of this life blow as a hurricane through our spirit, we will be blown about with them because we're not standing firm. And that firm stand only comes... With the influence of God. Look at verse 8. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king saying, Why have you torn, his cl cl torn your clothes? Let him come to me that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So word reaches the far reaches of the country that the king has torn his, his robes, that the king is in, in deep grief and in deep sadness and having his emotions on display in that manner. And Elisha hears about it, Elisha, the great man of God, and he says, that, 
not just Naaman, but that the world would know there is a prophet in Israel. What he's saying, that the world would know that there is a God in Israel who still moves. Send him to me and I'll heal him. Now, he's not, Elisha's not doing this for the benefit of the king to alleviate the king's anxiety because it's not about the king. Elisha's not doing this to prevent war between Syria and Israel. Elisha's doing this to bring God glory. That's what it's all about. All that Elisha cares about is aiming at the Lord. And so he tells the king, send him to me, and I'll take care of it. So the king says, oh yeah, Elisha. Naaman, go see him. Verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. Now try to picture this as best you can with what's about to happen. Naaman comes, and remember, he is... The king of Syria's right-hand man. He's a very important guy. So he's got horses and chariots. He's got this massive entourage in addition to all that treasure that he brought to pay off the prophet because that was his mindset. That's what they did in his culture. When you go to ask a prophet something, you bring a whole bunch of money to give to the prophet so he'll do what you want. And so he's brought all this money and, and changes of clothes and stuff to give to the prophet to get what he wants. And he shows up with all this massive stuff and he's there at the gate at the door of Elisha's house, waiting on Elisha. And the image is Elisha's inside, sitting in his big lazy boy chair, watching his BC TV. And look at what he does in verse 10. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean." But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. So Naaman's response is anger and rage. First off, he's angry because Elisha didn't come himself. Elisha didn't want to get up out of his chair. Elisha just sent a messenger. The messenger doesn't even have a name at this point. He's just some guy that was hanging around Elisha's house. Hey, go tell that Naaman to go wash in the Jordan River seven times. And so he goes to the door, opens the door, Naaman's standing there thinking that the prophet's going to come out or they're going to usher him into the house with great pomp and circumstance. And, the, pro- and the, the messenger cracks the door and says, hey, go wash in the Jordan River seven times and you'll be clean. And he shuts the door. And Naaman is just, just blown away. I, does he not know who I am? I am Naaman. I came all this way. Look at all this treasure I've got lined up here. I, I, I command hundreds of thousands of people in the army And this guy won't even come to the door and talk to me. So he's angry because of the messenger. He's irritated because of the messenger. It wounds his pride. But he also doesn't like the manner. He's frustrated because of the manner. He thought that the prophet would come out and wave his hand over the leprosy and heal him. And the prophet wants him to go and wash in the river? He's, He's frustrated because of the messenger, of the manner he contradicted his presumption. He assumed about the way God was going to move and the way God was going to work. And then finally, he's frustrated because of the means. He thought that the rivers of Damascus, as he says there, are nicer, they're prettier, they're cleaner. The Jordan River is dirty and nasty and gross. And he wants me to go down in the Jordan River and wash. Who does this guy think he is? So he's frustrated because of the messenger, he's frustrated because of the manner, he's irritated because of the means, it impacts his reputation, the way he will be perceived, but how often is that also true with us? We grow spiritually frustrated oftentimes because of the messenger who brings God's word, that it wounds our pride in the way God presents something to us sometimes. Or we may grow spiritually frustrated because of the manner that something is brought. We had an assumption. We had a presumption of the way God was going to move. God moved this way before, and so he's going to move this way again. And God moves in a way we weren't expecting, and it frustrates us. It irritates us that it is not how we assumed it would happen. Or maybe it's the means. 
We, we, you know, we finally come to grips with the messenger, finally come to grips with the man, or we get down to the means that God wants us to do it this way, but this way isn't comfortable. This way will make us maybe lose our reputation. We'll be perceived a certain way if we do this the way God wants us to do it, and he wants us to come over here and do it this way. And so we can grow spiritually frustrated. But ultimately, if Naaman would have done this thing, he would be cured of his leprosy that has plagued him his life. But in the moment, he's raged, he's angry, he's not thinking clearly because he's frustrated about the messenger and the manner and the means. He's not thinking about the end result, which is his ultimate healing. Uh, Look at verse 13. His servants speak up, just as before. Apparently this guy had some very loyal servants. Verse 13. But his servants came near and said to him, My father... It is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So his servants came to him and said, this is a great word he spoke to you. You don't have to do something complicated. You don't have to do something, you know, uh, 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 some, some massive, unbelievable thing. You just got to go down and dip your head, your body in the river seven times. Yeah, it's a dirty river, but so it's just seven times. Just go down and do it. What's the worst that could happen? So Naaman, having walked it off and calmed himself down a little bit, he says, okay, and he goes down there and does it. And look at what God does. God is a God of, a, of, of abundance. He doesn't just restore Naaman's skin to what it would be for a, however, 40-year-old, 45, 50-year-old man. He restores his skin to the perfection of a child. And Naaman comes up, and he is just amazed at what God did. And so in that moment, then his anger and his rage are gone. His, his frustration about the, the messenger and the manner and the means are gone. All he can see is what God has done in his life. You see, that is the problem a lot of times with our level of expectation about how God would do something. We expect God's movement to be a certain way. And in doing that, we are relying more on the how than the who. You see, expectation of the manner of God's movement looks to the system and not the source. Naaman had an expectation. He was looking to the system about how this was going to take place. The prophet was going to come out. He was going to wave his hand. He was going to say some words. Or maybe he'll have me go wash in a beautiful river. But instead, it's the opposite of what Naaman assumed would happen. And so his expectations were blown to bits, but all because he was looking at the system and not the source. It was God who empowered the system. And that was a problem with the nation of Israel. It's a problem with all of us today. We expect God to do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again in the exact same way. I heard a preacher a couple of weeks ago. He was talking about the nation of Israel, when they left Egypt, you know, they were being guided every day by a a, a pillar of cloud in the daytime and a a pillar of fire at night. And something the scripture says, I'm probably going to do a a sermon series on this at one point, at some point in the future, but it talks about, so you're getting a preview of that, that uh, the pillar of cloud would go and then it would stop and, and the nation would stop there and they would be there for as long as the pillar stopped whether it was one day or a week or a month or several years. They had no idea. However long they were going to be there, they were going to be there until God moved. And the reason God did that is so they would not become reliant upon the system. You see, if God moved every Friday at 7 p.m., they would become dependent upon the system. They would have relegated God's movement to a formula, which is something we often do. If I say those exact same words, if I sit in that exact same place, if I sing those exact same songs, if I dress in the exact same clothes, then God is going to honor all those things I did, and he is going to do what I want him to do. And we miss out that he is the source, and he is not the system. We have empowered the system when it is the source that has the power. That's why God, in the, uh, when Israel exited Egypt, moved when he wanted to move, and the people had to move with him. And here... It's the same thing. Naaman was looking to the wrong thing and missing out on the true source 
of power. So we have the king who had removed intentionally the influence of God from his life, and he was missing where God was aiming, where God wanted him to aim. And we have Naaman, who was so caught up in his assumption and his expectation that he almost missed out on a healing if his life had not been intervened upon. And now finally, I want you to look at one more thing, something we read and and moved right past. But that little girl back up in verse 2. Let's read that one more time. Now the Syrians on one of the raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that my lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. Now it's amazing to me about this little girl. As I said earlier, most likely her family was killed, and she was taken captive. She probably had all of these hopes and dreams about what her life would look like. And now she is a slave in a foreign country with nobody she knows, no mom and dad anymore. She's in this other household. And what does she do when she discovers that her new master has leprosy? She points him to the Lord. In the moment, she doesn't point to her situation and say, woe is me, my life is horrible. All I can do is complain about how bad I've got it. My life is bad, my life is terrible. I'm in the household of this terrible, terrible people who killed my family, and now they're making me serve them day in and day out. My life is bad. That's not what she does. Because she's not aiming at herself, at her ruined life plan. She aims at the Lord, and she points her captors to the Lord. That's all that she cares about in the moment is pointing To the Lord, most likely because she's not plugged into the system of her life. She's plugged in to the source. Full power comes from plugging into the source, not the system. You see, we need to allow Jesus to influence the trajectory of our lives because where you aim is where you go. The target determines the aim. The target determines the aim. The target for that little girl was the Lord. And she aimed at him. And she aimed her master at him and ultimately resulted in his healing. And so now he would be healed and he's going to go back and be in the court of the king of Syria and speak about the greatness of God before somebody who detests the work of God. God had a great plan. All because a little girl was aiming at the Lord. You see, we've got several targets around the room. Here, And if I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that the Lord wants me to aim at that target right there, I'm never going to hit it if all I'm doing is aiming at that target back there. If I spend my whole life pursuing that target, aiming at that target, I will get really good at hitting that target. But that means nothing if the Lord wants me to hit that one. I'm never going to hit that one if all I do is aim at that one. If I can know the Lord wants me to hit that one, he wants me to spend time with him every day, he wants me to to be a part of church, he wants me to know him, he wants me to believe in Jesus, he he wants me to to, uh, be a good father, to, to not be selfish, to be a good husband. Even if I aim at that target back there, I say, well, I'm a little bit closer, but I'm still nowhere near hitting where God wants me to hit. If I'm not aiming where he wants me to aim... I'm never going to hit what he wants me to hit. You go where you aim. You see, it's that way. Your life will produce patterns, and those patterns will determine where you go. You know, in your life, if you know you need to spend time with the Lord every day, but your pattern is to sleep in every day, then you will go where your pattern has already determined, and you'll be aiming at that target and not that one. Target determines the aim. You see, how you shoot reflects how you train, and so you need to train better to aim better. It takes practice to hit the target the Lord wants you to hit. You see, if you, like me, are aiming at the wrong target on occasion, it's going to take us time and time and time again, practice, to get to the target he wants us to hit. We're going to need to be pursuing him. And the key to that is that we allow him to influence us. You see, 
just like the king in the story, if we have removed the influence of the Lord from our lives, then we will never be aiming at the target he wants us to aim at. If we are allowing other things to influence us more than we're allowing the Lord to influence us, then we're never going to get over there. We're never going to be aimed at the target he wants us to aim at, ever, ever. We're only going to be aiming at the target that w- of the influencers that we have allowed in our lives. So what words are being spoken into you? What have you allowed to influence you more than the Lord? Are you like the king who has removed the influences of God? from your life? Are you like Naaman, whose presumption and expectation has damaged what he thought God was going to do? Or are you like this little girl, who no matter the life circumstance, because she's plugged into the source, no matter what wind blows through her life, she does not blow with it. She's plugged into the source, and her target is the Lord, and so that's where she's going. And she's going to bring even her captors along with her, because that's where she knows she needs to go. And so in your life, is your target Jesus? I can tell you all day long, that's where your target needs to be. Your target needs to be Jesus. He can tell us all day long in Scripture, and he does. But if you're, the patterns of your life do not dictate that you're aiming at Jesus, then you're careening off into a path that will lead to your devastation. Whether ultimately in pain and punishment after death, or in this life through repeated poor decisions. You see, the first step in hitting the target he desires is to believe in Jesus. He came down into the mess that we've created in this world because he loved us. He didn't leave us where we are. He came to where we are to help us get out of the mess. He desires us to follow the path he's laid out because it's the best life possible. So if you need to believe in Jesus today, it's your opportunity. You need to believe that Jesus is God's son and that he came to this earth And he died so that all your sins and mistakes and mess-ups would be forgiven. And then he rose from the dead so that you can live after death. So that death is the introduction into a better life. So you need to believe in Jesus. Or maybe you just need to begin to aim at his target. Begin to change the patterns of your life. So that Jesus becomes where you're aiming. So where are you aiming today? If you were to take an assessment of your life, let's say the last seven days, and you said, last seven days, where have I been aiming with my life? Have they been at my pursuits and my selfishness and what I want and my assumptions about the way things should be? Or have I been aiming at Jesus? And then what do I need to begin to shift in my life? So that my aim becomes true and the trajectory of my life goes right down the patterns that Jesus desires. Aim at Jesus.